Well, it's an honor to be here today to share my story with you and why I have been called fearless, but why I'm not quite sure that I am fearless. But what I'd like to do before I get started with my story is I'd like to take everybody through a, a bit of a visualization exercise. So I want you to think, not knowing anything about me, I just want you to put yourself in a position where, you know, imagine that you're driving to work, you're in your car, it's a very typical day for you. There's nothing out of the ordinary, nothing has happened in your life to cause any changes. Um, you're, you've got your coffee, you've got the radio playing, but you see the, the police cruiser in, in your rear view mirror, you see the lights flashing, so you, you know you're gonna get pulled over. And you get a little nervous because you're thinking, I wasn't doing anything wrong, why would this happen? But you pull over, and you see two officers approach your car, one on either side, and th they have a very stern look on their face. It's just something doesn't feel right. And next thing you know, the door is opening up, you're being pulled out of the car, and you're being told you're under arrest. And, I mean, not only, your mind is blown, you have no idea what's going on, you're not being explained anything, you're being put in handcuffs, and you really have no idea what's happening because you know you haven't done anything wrong, you don't know where this is coming from. You're brought to the station, you're, you're put through the whole process, and you're still, you, you're not thinking about anything because you're just in complete and utter shock. You have no idea why this is happening to you. you you're, you're released from custody, you're being told you're going to be charged with some criminal offenses, you, you go and meet with a lawyer and you're just blown away. You don't know what's going on. The lawyer says, well, this is what you're being charged with. This is what it's gonna to cost to defend yourself. As the process plays out, you're being told there's evidence against you that you committed these criminal offenses. And eventually, you know, you keep saying, I haven't done anything. Like, where's this coming from? Where's the evidence? I wanna see all this. Your lawyer says, well, if you wanna see the evidence, if you really wanna fight this, because you, you're saying you're not guilty, then you're gonna to have to pay me about a $60,000 retainer and we'll go to trial. So, you, and you're just in a place where, I was on my way to work. I mean, I hadn't done anything wrong. What's happening? And I don't have $60,000. So then the, the prosecutor says, well, you know, if, if you just plead guilty, we'll make this all go away. You won't have a criminal record. All this will be done. And you can go back to your life. You can go back to your job. So eventually you start saying, well, where do I sign? I mean, I have to make this go away. What do I do to make this go away? So at the end of the day, you're someone who says, I haven't done anything wrong. How can this happen? How can our system allow this to happen? And my only chance at justice is to, to pay a lawyer $60,000 to have a trial. Well, I can tell you, it happens. And that's part of my story, and that's part of how I got here today. So in, in uh, 1998 is where I'm going to start my story. I graduated from University of Western Ontario. And um, it's, I say this is the start because for me, I, I, I didn't have a care in the world besides just, I'm finished university, I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to start my life. This is my older sister, my mom, um, and my dad in this picture. So what really happened for me was just a brief five years later, um, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, and she had uh, a very aggressive and incurable form of cancer. This photo was taken after she had surgery. They had to basically cut her from end to end, and they took half of her stomach and half of her colon, and she was trying some experimental chemos. So for me, you know, obviously this really turned my life upside down. Um, in January 20, or 2004, it was my 25th birthday, it was a Friday night, and my mom said, I think, I think I'm gonna die tonight. So, you know, we, we said our goodbyes. It was the next morning that she passed away. So here I am, 2004, I'm a few years out of university, I'm trying to get a job, I'm trying to start my life, and now I'm saying goodbye to my mom. So, ironically, the same year, I gave birth to my first child. I was probably pregnant when my mom passed away, but I didn't realize because of everything else. Um, didn't take long, if you fast forward, now I'm grieving the loss of my mom, I have my first child. Not long after, I have three children, and I'm a single mother. So here I am, the date is, I forgot to update the date, but this would be about 2009. I now have three children, and I'm a single mom deciding what I'm gonna do with my life. I need a better paying job. It's gonna be hard supporting three kids on my own. So in 2010, I decided to get a job with the Waterloo Regional Police Service. So I was hired in December of 2010, and it was, for the first four years, it was the greatest job you can ever have. I was working patrol, so I was alone in my cruiser attending calls for services, or calls for service emergencies, but it, it was me on my own, and I was really able to take my role as a community leader you know, to heart and really do my best. Um, four years into my career, I was promoted to headquarters to be a use of force instructor. So now I was teaching new recruits when they come into the service, teaching existing officers annually for their annual requalification, and I was teaching everything from the educational 
classroom stuff right to firearms, you know, carbine rifle, de defensive tactics, everything. So it was very exciting. It was a, a good challenge for me. Um, but working up at headquarters meant that I had contact with every officer at the service. So I would hear lunchtime gossip. I would hear about rumors. Um, I'd see the way things happen in the executive wing and the conversations that are had at headquarters. Um, but I would also, so part of that being at headquarters meant I was starting to see what I thought was internal corruption. I was starting to hear about things that were happening that I knew weren't right. I was starting to read headlines in the newspaper about officers that were being arrested criminally and how they'd go through their trial process, but then be not only acquitted, but unequivocally acquitted, you know, emphatically acquitted by judges. And I just started thinking, you know, how is all this happening when we are police officers? We should be, you know, when we do an investigation against our own, it should be, you know, the most excellent and, you know, perfect, no holes in this investigation whatsoever, but that was happening. So as I started to ask questions and do my own research, I started to learn that some of these investigations were alleged to be negligent. These officers were saying these were negligent investigations against other officers. I started to learn that as processes would go through in court, there'd be evidence that would come forward to negate the charge, but it would never be presented in court because it, it would look like we made a mistake, so we're not gonna release that information. And I personally made a criminal allegation against a member of my service that I witnessed be swept under the rug. They weren't even investigating it. So as time went on, it just continued to build in me that I knew we weren't doing things right. I knew that there were decisions being made that were not in line with the law and they were because, you know, popularity maybe um, for political reasons. But I, had, I, I knew that I had to do something, so I started looking at, you know, if I'm working at the police service, I'm a police officer, what can I do to address this? So I thought there must be a policy that the service has that says when there's an allegation about a member, this is how we investigate it, and it's A, B, C, D, and it's all going to be laid out there. I thought if I can look to this policy and then say that there's investigators at the service that are doing something wrong, then I can make a complaint about them and their conduct can be brought into, into the spotlight. But then I found out that my service doesn't have a policy that outlines how we investigate our own police against police. So I went to the provincial complaints body. It's a civilian organization that deals with complaints about police misconduct. I looked at the legislation about how do I make a complaint to this body, but they don't take complaints if you're a police officer. You have to be a member of the public. So I, I said, I have this complaint. They said, we, we're not allowed to accept it from you. You're a police officer. So then I thought, well, if I was a member of the public and I, I wanted to complain to my service, there's gotta be a policy at the service for how they handle complaints. So I looked at that policy. Ironically, the policy was changed in 2014, which was right around the time that the other officer was emphatically acquitted. So at that time, the service changed the policy because he wanted his investigation in, looked into. So they changed it and they said, no, if you want to make a complaint now, you have to be a member of the public. A member of our service cannot complain because we don't want to hear from you. So I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I was at the point where I was coming into work, I hated myself, I hated that I represented what I represented, I, I hated putting my uniform on and looking in the mirror, I hated when little kids would wave at me because I thought, I don't represent what you think I represent. And I knew I had to do something. In 2016, what I decided to do is I went to my police services board. The board is a group of elected officials in my community that are civilian, they're put in place to oversee the police service. And I, I got myself on the agenda, I showed up there to give a 10 minute delegation, and no one had any idea what I was gonna be discussing. And this was right after the YWCA had awarded me the Women of Distinction Award in my community. So I, I honestly think that they were a little naive and they thought I was coming there just to talk about how great the service is and how much I love my job. I walked in there, the chief knew me by name, shook my hand, I sat down, I started speaking and I, I told them everything. I said, you know, when I came in here, I came in here because I thought that with a, as a person who has high integrity and is an honest individual, I thought I would excel here. But here I am and I'm in a position where I don't want to be a police officer anymore because of what I'm seeing around me. And you're not even giving me a mechanism to voice my concern other than coming here. You know, everything I said was honest. I didn't, I didn't say anything that wasn't true. I didn't expose any internal police business. I discussed cases that had already wrapped up in court. But as a result of my presentation, I faced reprisal. So a week after my presentation, I was brought into the Internal Affairs Division, the same people I complained about, and they sat me down and I was given a chief's directive which said you cannot communicate with anybody on the board anymore because they didn't like what I was telling the board. 
I was told you're not going to be a use of force trainer anymore. You're going to work on administrative duties, which meant that an officer was taken off the road to replace me in training. So there's one less officer patrolling the streets. And I was told you're going to be investigated, sorry, you're going to be investigated for eight Police Service Act charges. And included in there was deceit. And deceit is a charge that they could terminate me for. So it was at that point that I knew, okay, you know, I, I, was, I, I was dumb enough, I guess, to think that when I did that delegation, they were going to say, you know, if what she's telling us is true, we have a serious problem on our hands. And this woman showed a lot of courage in coming here to expose this to us. You know, we need to sit down with her. We need to figure out how we can change our policies, make everything better, you know, make sure that this doesn't happen again. But here I am. Now I'm the one, you know, being vilified, being made to look like I did something wrong. So over the course of 14 months, <laughs> I came to work, I worked on the desk, I put out the best work I'd ever put out because I wasn't going to let them get the better of me. I was putting use of force stats reports together that my deputy said were the best he'd seen in 30 years. I did not want, to, I did not want them to see me struggle. Eventually, everything caught up to me. I, I had PTSD related to an incident that happened to me when I was training at the college and that all started to come back. It became very, very difficult for me to stay at work. But nothing led up. The discipline was still happening. They were still investigating me. Everything was still happening. And I knew that I didn't have a career there. So in the 14 months, every day I would go home. I would research cases on my computer. I would look up previous cases and find out how did, how did they do this to me? How is this possible? But the more I started researching, the more I realized that I wasn't the first person to try to do this. Other officers had done what I had done, and they'd been disciplined, they'd been fired, they'd been let go. There were RCMP members who exposed a pension scandal, and some of them were outright fired because of what they tried to expose there. It had been happening everywhere. So as I found these cases, I started compiling them all in one place. And the end result was a 93-page research paper that I had written at the time. And this was my way of saying, you know, you hear about these cases, as a member of the public, you hear these cases and you think, that must be a bad apple, there must be this dirty cop over here, you know, there's these things happening. But when you put all these cases together and you see that, you know, often these officers are acquitted, often there's allegations of internal corruption that nobody really wants to pay attention to, but when you look that they're happening everywhere and you see them all in one document, it becomes much more powerful. So when I had this document together, I didn't know what to do with it, but I started off by going to these provincial agencies that we have that are supposed to oversee police. I even went as high as the Ombudsman of Ontario when I sent them the report. They actually read it because it took them two weeks to get back to me, but they said, we're not going to get involved in this. This doesn't seem like something that falls under our mandate. I went to the ministers responsible for policing in Ontario. They didn't want to help. So at the end of the day, Justin Trudeau had it, Kathleen Wynne had it, but nobody wanted to get back in touch with me. So I was in a spot where I just thought, what do I do now? I've tried everything. They're silencing me at the police service. I can't even talk to the board anymore. So I had to resign. I had to leave my job in order to have a voice because as long as I worked there, I was bound by the oath of secrecy. I'm not allowed to talk and they'll do everything they can to keep me quiet. So eventually I sent this report to every member of parliament from Ontario, every member of provincial parliament in Ontario, and I sent it to the media. And I sent it to about 650 emails in July of 2017 when I resigned. So what I did is I eventually took that 93 page research paper and I made it much more readable and understandable and I've converted that into a book. And I, I seriously consider it the handbook for Canadian policing. It talks about the cases where officers have, you know, they allege they're being discriminated against for racial purpose and then they're, and then they're disciplined. You've got female officers that report that they're being discriminated against for their gender and then they're disciplined. You've got people, there's an officer in Cornwall, Ontario that in the 90s exposed a pedophile ring in Cornwall and he was disciplined because he shared information with children's aid to protect the children. It is ridiculous how often this happens, but it's happening everywhere. So, you know, I, I have been selling the book to some members of police service boards because they do want to know what has happened and what can we do to change it. Um, when I first went public, I had some news coverage, CTV Kitchener. You know, most of it was cent centered around KW. Because again, most people wanted to see me as just, you know, I'm someone who's disgruntled, I'm unhappy, I, I don't like my chief, you know, I'm angry with the service, whatever it is. But nobody really understood the gravity of what I was trying to expose, was the secrecy in policing and what they can hide that happens inside closed doors. Um, I've also, since resigning, been traveling across Canada to, ch to share my story. So I've done talks with the Conference Board of Canada in Toronto. I traveled to Edmonton to speak at a Canadian Institute conference. Um, I was at the Institute of Public Administrators of Canada in Charlottetown, PEI. I've been at Ch Brantford Chamber of Commerce, the Centre for Transformative Social Change at Humber College in Toronto. 
and I was at the St. John's One Woman um, in Newfoundland. I've also been going across Ontario to the police services that will allow me, I have been declined, but to the ones that will allow me, I've been speaking at their board meetings, which are public and open to the public. So my, I basically go there just to say, we know there are problems in policing, there are things that can be done in the interest of positive change. Um, bill 175 was a recent bill that passed through legislation to change policing legislation. And the first time I attended there to participate in public debate, I shared my story. I said, this cannot happen. You cannot put officers in a position where in order for them to do the right thing, they're going to know that they're going to lose their job because you're giving the control to the people they're complaining about to, to either terminate them, discipline them, whatever the case is. I, and when I shared my story, again, they think it's a little bit, you know, they think there's no way. This is like a Hollywood story. This can't be happening. But when I say it is, and it continues to happen, and it has historically happened, there's no, there's no desire to change it. There's no motivation to put anything in place that would protect people like me in the future. So the bill went through and was passed and everything stayed the way it was proposed. I, I actually attended twice. The second time I went there, I went on behalf of the National Women in Law Enforcement Association that I've been partnering with. And we were advocating at this time about the PTSD legislation because the new bill would give the chief of police the authority to terminate an employee who's disabled. So someone who's dealing with PTSD or you know, injures themselves permanently on the job, they can be terminated because they're of no use to them anymore. So when you talk about the thin blue line, you know, I was put in a position where if I chose to stay and maintain secrecy of what I knew, I knew this was happening, but I wasn't gonna say anything because it's not my place and I'm gonna keep quiet, I'd be on the good side of the thin blue line. For me, I couldn't do that because it was not only was it eating me up inside morally, I couldn't do it because that's not who I am. And I believe that in order for the, the world to be a better place, our police have to be the ones we trust. They have to be the ones that we know are the most ethical and the most moral, and that's not the way it is now. So in order for me to do that, I had to say that I was not going to maintain secrecy, that I was not going to live in the culture of fear anymore. When you talk about fearlessness, it, for me, it's not, I'm not fearless, but what I had to do was prioritize. I had to take the fear that I had, that when I expose this, I'm going to face retaliation. I'm going to be harassed. I'm going to be alienated from my peers, ostracized. I had to accept all that and choose to do the right thing over my fear. So my fear is still there. I still have a fear that they are going to continue to harass me, that they are going to continue to try to make sure my business is not successful, make sure that my life is miserable, and make sure that I keep quiet. I have that fear every day, and it is a legitimate fear because they are trying. But what I wanted to highlight as well is that when you talk about all the issues in policing, I addressed issues of corruption and internal affairs. We've got women from the west to the east in Ontario doing the same thing. Windsor Police had an officer that came public and said there is systemic gender discrimination at Windsor Police. So we're on the west side of, of Ontario. You go to the east side of Ontario and you see that there was a woman in Ottawa who said there's systemic gender, gender discrimination at Ottawa Police and the Human Rights Tribunal ordered that there be a gender audit conducted at Ottawa Police. The, the results of that audit did not surprise any of the women at Ottawa. They said you do have systemic issues of gender discrimination. There's women, all the women of Waterloo uh, Police, which is where I worked, filed a $167 million class action lawsuit a few weeks before I decided to resign, and that was for system systemic gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. Then uh, there was a female officer in Toronto who's been battling Toronto Police for four years in our Human Rights Tribunal. It's cost her over $100,000 in legal bills to defend herself and say that there is systemic sexual harassment at Toronto Police. And again, everybody wants to say, well, she's probably just somebody who hasn't had things go her way. But shortly after she did, a Sergeant Jessica McInnes did the same thing. And she said, no, it's happening everywhere. It's happening at my division. It's happening at Heather's division. And when Jessica went public shortly after, she was disciplined. Because they said, you know, you told us about this harassment, but you're telling us it happened a long time ago. You should have told us then. We're going to discipline you because you didn't tell us when it first happened. And, and they're allowed to do this. So, you know, when you talk about change, we talk about women making change, but in Ontario policing, it is the women that are fighting for change. We're sacrificing our careers, we're sacrificing our livelihoods, we're spending money out of our own pockets to fight a system that is impenetrable to change. So, you know, if, if it wasn't for the women in Ontario policing, you'd see status quo happening for the next 30 years like it has for the last 30 years. 
So what is fit for duty? I mean, I created fit for duty because I, I look at police in particular, but it's any industry. But as police officers, we say that if you're fit for duty, that you're healthy and, you, and you've got what it takes to be a police officer. You've got muscles, you know, you can do the job, you can break up a bar fight. But I'm trying to turn it into something more than that and say that it's an ethical standard. You, if you're not ethically fit for duty, there's no job that you should be allowed to do, let alone policing. Um, but what I have been doing is to make change, again, like I said, I've been partnering with the National Women in Law Enforcement Association. Um, and we're doing different things, like just general um, advocacy, le taking certain legal action, and, and it's overall political awareness of what's going on. Um, with my business, I'm trying to work my way across Canada and improve the ethical standard of businesses using training, things like whistleblower programs, because there still is no protection in Canada for whistleblowers. There's legislation to protect provincial and federal public servants. If you work in a financial firm and you report to the securities, the um, Ontario Securities Commission, then you have protection, but nobody else does. So whenever someone is in a position like me where you witness something on the job, you wanna report it, you're not protected against the harassment that's gonna happen to you, the you know alienation that you're gonna have from your peers, there's nothing. So what ends up happening is you, every workplace breeds a culture of fear because nobody wants to say anything about what they're seeing. So I have a personal website, that's the kellydonovan.ca, and I did that because I'm trying to run my business, but the, the, the advocate side of me wants to share my story as well. So the kellydonovan.ca is my story. It's where I've been, places, people I've talked to, people who have turned me down. I will publicly say who has turned me down because I think that's something the taxpayer needs to know is who is not transparent enough to invite me in and hear what I have to say. And then my business website is the fitforduty.ca. But these are all of my social media handles and I'd love to connect that way because I am all over the place and I'm very busy and to keep up with what I'm doing. I also have a mailing list for my website and I've got a sign up sheet at my table and I did bring a few copies of my book. Um, but basically my message today was to talk about fearlessness and just that it's not the absence of fear, it's prioritizing wh what's important to you. So I had that fear and like I said, I still have that fear today. I will never be completely out of that fear because they have a lot of control over me, much more than I have over them. But I'm prioritizing doing what's right and I've done that from the very beginning. So for me, I had to do what's right then, I'm gonna to continue to do what's right now. That fear is always there, but I'm just not letting it rule my life. It's important to me that I can wake up in the morning and be proud of myself again and be proud of what I'm doing and I can do that now. Thank you.